Bam. Hey, this is Jeffrey Fisher, and you're watching the Break It Down Show. I love it. I love getting a chance to talk to my friends who are warriors like me and have a lot of knowledge and just to lift up those voices because it's easy. Look, it's easy to be a talking head, have an opinion about war. That's another thing. If you've actually gone there and fought it and not just from behind a desk, but actually been out and, and done things. So, Jeff, thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate you. Absolutely. It's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here again. So obviously I didn't do too bad the first time because I got I got the call back. So I, I you got the call back. Just barely though. Let's, you know what? C minus still a good score. D plus right. still That's passing. Right. So it's all right. That's what we're going for here is is the 12 bounce base hit up the middle. We're like, That's still on first, you know. <laughs> Go from there. Hey, uh, you are working on a foundation. You talked about it last episode. I want to make sure we start there so people can understand uh, where your charitable heart is and what you're trying to fix. Sure. So, so big stuff. Yeah, we just launched our foundation. Uh, we are uh, registered. It's the equivalent of here in Austria. It's called it, it's called a Verein, but it's a 501c3. The name of the it's called Shelter to Service dot org. Uh, that's a two in there. It's all big one word. Shelter to Service. Uh, you can find us on Twitter S 2 S Europe. Uh, but basically, our our uh, our mission is finding shelter dogs that are viable that we can train uh, to be service animals for disabled veterans uh, and um, disabled first responders located all over Europe. Right. So uh, as a guy who's fought in war and fought alongside Lithuanians and Latvians and Estonians and Romanians and Germans and all these NATO allies that fought with us in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, what I quickly learned when I was living over here in Austria is they don't have service dogs for their guys who've uh, lost arms, lost legs, uh, have PTSD, lost eyes. So my wife and I thought that was wrong. <laughs> so we uh, were deciding to try and fix it. We've done a proof of concept. Uh, I, uh, due to my medical disabilities, I was qualified to have a dog and I couldn't get one. So we we went out and found Zoe, who's our uh, our Belarusian uh, abandoned in Austria dog. So I've got a white Russian running around here uh, at my feet right now, and uh, and she's she's great, right? So um, uh, we're taking donations. Uh, we're 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 doing great things. Like I said, we it took us a year and a half because um, I know you would talk, I, you would you and I talked a little bit offline about this about the. Uh, uh, these and and look getting them right at the beginning the foundation is hard right the foundation of the yeah. foundation so it yeah. took us a year and a half to make sure with the proof of concept and finding dogs and seeing if it was viable and uh yeah so the, so we're, we're we're kind of proud that's probably zoe you can hear in the background barking right she's not very happy and have you branded uh the white russian uh drink to like you, have, you pet your white russian and you drink your white russian at the same time well it's a it's a black lab from white russia so it's it's uh oh. yeah yeah, gotta yeah. Work on that. all right well either way white, white russian black russian whatever you just yeah. as long as you're sipping on the cocktail hey yeah. so the other day, uh, John Spencer, who I'm working on getting John back on the show. John is so white hot and he's, I've known John for a number of years now and he was already on the urban warfare thing and he wrote books about it and said, Hey, it's coming. You know, like if you imagine being in a hundred story building, having to clear that thing, like these things are real. And since then, um, his experience is access to the battlefield to come in, not only as a warrior, he's not fighting, but uh, to come in with that mindset, but also as an academic to say, this is how the battle of Kiev went. This is how, you know, the battle of whatever it's going to be, you know, whatever the fights are. He's getting frontline access. He's talking to world leaders about this. And so when he speaks up, it's it is a true crystal clear voice of authority he's not new to this game and so um i wanted first off to shout out to john spencer who again we'll try to get back on the show soon and his incredible work but when you see his work when people put out the messaging on the hamas side or even the israeli side and say you know here's what's going on and john's going no that's not what's going on it's it's impressive so i guess what are your thoughts on john's work and then let's dive into some of that exchange on x that we had the other day yeah. So John and I, um, <laughs> we go back about a year because uh, we were we were working really hard on uh, Twitter slash X really uh, to, to try and bring some truth to to a lot of the stuff that was going. And John, John actually has commented a lot about on you. I mean, he's like you said, he's the Battle of Ukraine. So right. So or the Battle of Kiev. So he's 
he, he and I are, are symbiotic. And when he had questions about F-16s and what was capable, and what's not, I would be like, okay, yeah. So we back channel DMs. And then when I'm like, hey, I, I don't understand this about urban warfare. So so we've had a lot of chats, right? And I'm yeah. proud. I mean, I'm, I'm proud to say I know him. I mean, his his his, uh, his stock has climbed, right? I mean, he's he's on some some pretty powerhouse shows, and that's great. And and I still call him a I consider him a friend. And 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 reach out to him on occasion, but he's 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 beyond my level now, right? He's a little busier, so I uh, <laughs> I lay off. But uh, so yeah, yeah. I, I like the guy, and I think uh, I think he tries to bring some level of of reality to this, uh, you know. And, and what's going on in Israel is a, tra- a tragedy, right? It's horrific, uh, and it, it's hard. But but that's what war is. I think people believe that somehow war should be neat and clean and follow some rules of the Geneva Convention and, you know, no civilians should die. And and perhaps, and th- th- this is a perhaps, right? Perhaps because the way the United States and the coalition has decided to fight wars over the last two decades, we've set, set some expectation globally on what all future wars should look like. I mean, th- there's probably a reason you're not seeing a lot of reporting out of Haiti right now, because if people saw truly how graphic war can be, I mean, you have cannibals eating humans, right? So, <laughs> so we may, maybe it's on us. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. Of, there's a lot of good points to be made there. Uh, one of them is we are really precious with the things we care about, you know. And so we didn't care about Yemen three years ago. People did not give a. I would ask. Our peers who had you know heavy opinions about things. What about Yemen? How, what, what are your thoughts on that? Like, that no matter, you know, because it doesn't matter for the most part. And all of a sudden, our shipping gets threatened. Um, they start launching rockets at us, and we get really yeah. willing to kill people real fast, right? And so as soon as it benefits us, it's like where do we have to drop the precision bombs or put in the Delta guys? By the way, those Delta guys are glad to go do their job, but it, every mission breaks them just a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit, until all of a sudden. You got some pretty torn up dudes who still work. And and basically, we burn out SEALs. We burn out Delta guys. That's what we do. And we lose track of that. So as soon as we get to, like, let's go get them. Like, understand, the the let's is you and me, you know. And uh, go get them means hurting us. And the people that we go get also get annihilated a lot of the time. And that's horrible. True. Yeah, you know, I remember at the, I think probably near the high water mark of U.S. forces in Afghanistan, um, what we were doing to our SOCOM and our soft community across all branch service, Navy, Army, Air Force, Marines was uh, was was tragic, right? I was watching the reports on this, and I mean, guys were 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 doing one to one dwell time, right? Which means, you know, mm-hmm. for the people who aren't military guys, it's one year in, in one year in theater, one year home, if not worse, right? And and you, you can't you can't live like that, right? I mean, that's. Yeah. Because when you're not in theater and you're back for that home one year, it's not at home, right? Six months of that is a workup to get, to get ready to, to go right. back in, right? Yeah. So uh, so it's horrible, right? Yeah. And that's if you're only doing that pace. That one-to-one often is nowhere near one-to-one because you also have to, oh, don't forget, you've got to go to this, at minimum, developmental school to put yourself that next rank on, you know, cause you are doing time and every year yeah. you are significantly closer to the next rank, 20%, a hundred percent, you know? And so like, well, you don't forget, you have to go get this school. So now you leave your family to go to a school and then you come back that work up, you know, you're on a, you know, all a your computer based training week. annually, the, you know, sexual <laughs> harassment, cyber, totally. cyber war. <laughs> yeah. Just, you please, never, please make you it never stop. stop. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. Doesn't stop. yeah. It's, it doesn't ever stop. So, when we get into these conflicts, you know, Sherman still has a say in, in the fact that war is grizzly. It's a monster. I, I talk about it like it's a dragon. And once you let, let it loose, it feasts on whatever it wants. And so you can say, but don't kill women and babies. And the dragon just like, Arr! it just kills whatever it wants to kill. And it kills for decades. You know, the, yeah. the damage from these wars, the Russian-Ukraine war, the Israeli-Palestinian war, it's going to kill people for a long time. It's not going to stop. It's not going to be gentle because war is not gentle. When we try to put it like a, you know, put like some kind of different shirt on the war dragon, it doesn't, it doesn't change a thing about it. And, and when you think about like the nature of humans, if you've done something horrible to somebody, or if you're around horrible things happening, yeah, you're aware that there might be rules and laws, but also you can justify any kind of bad behavior. And and so we expect people to act differently than we have acted here in the United States. We've killed a lot of people and uh, our own people, 
with with these kind of decisions. And so you're right, war is not a gentle thing. Yeah. Uh, you would, know, you, I, would you? Would you? Yeah. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, it, it, um, I, I, I served in the in the diplomatic corps as a military guy, right? So I served in embassies, and I, there's a lot of there's a lot of diplomat guys that I that I really like. There's a lot of State Department folks that I really love. So I, this isn't a slam across the entire entire right. State Department, right? But I, I would tell you that if I was ever to find out who was the the creator, right, of the the notion or the idea of a um, conditional surrender, right? A conditional end of a war and a ceasefire, I'd probably strangle them, right? <laughs> because mm. because this notion that we, we can bring sides together, we say stop fighting and we're going to set conditions, right? It's not an unconditional surrender, it's conditional. Then right. each side takes away from those, even, no matter how good the law is written, each side will read that very differently, right? And they will read it to their own advantage. Uh, and and these things never end. I mean, that that we can look at Korea, right? We can look at Kosovo. We can we can look at the frozen conflicts in in South Ossetia, Abkhazia, Transnistria. And, and and the problem is, this is another example where the U.S. government, right or wrong, has has created this situation where we said, look, if we could just get them to stop fighting then eventually they're going to get along. It'll take two or three generations, but we just stop them from fighting and they'll all get along and it'll be fine. And the truth is that that it doesn't work. That, that unconditional surrender truly does end a war. When one side shows up at a table with a blank piece of paper <laughs> that says, okay, dude, like, what, what do you need me to do? <laughs> like, and right. Whatever you say, I'm going to do, just stop the bombing. Th that's how they end. And that's the dragon that you're talking about, right? You have to unleash the dragon to the point where you're like, can you can you put the dragon back on a leash? <laughs> we, yeah. we need the dragon to go away. So so yeah, it's 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 un it's unfortunate. And and I mean, we now have the Biden administration. This isn't a, this isn't a Republican Democrat, you know, Trump Biden thing. I'm just yeah. saying, right, Biden right now, who's got political pressures come out. And he said, hey, I want to try and find a way that we can, you know, get a ceasefire and get some the sides to the table. And I I'm like, uh, here we go again, right? We're, we're going to be set with another Gaza, Israel, Hamas shooting rockets at each other for another three decades. Like, dude, one, one of them has to win. <laughs> I, yeah. I'll tell you, it, it's a funny, real quick, there's a funny joke in this, right? And it's not really, war isn't funny, but when I was a kid, I used to really love this song called The Boys Are Back in Town, right? I don't know if, if you know it, right? And there's a, there's a line and it says, if the boys want to fight, you got to let them. And I always loved that line when I was a kid. And as I as I grew older, I realized now I like it because, yeah, you, you, if you break up a fight, someone's still going to want to fight, right? <laughs> like you just gotta, you gotta let them fight. And I, yeah. Whether it's in a school ground or in Gaza. I put a link down below to a, a story about yesterday, Easter, okay. um, the, the Myanmar conflict, you know, a, a battalion being destroyed out there. So the reason why I bring this up, one, is uh, pay attention, everybody. There's a lot of war going on out there. And if you're going to have a hard opinion about one of the wars, understand that there's other wars to talk about. Uh, two, how much of this is an information operation, right? And so people say a PSYOP. It's actually an information operation. And so when we have these informed opinions about um, Hamas and Israel, what they're doing or what the Russians are doing with Ukraine uh, or against Ukraine, <clears throat> you know, how informed are you? I mean, are you informed enough to know about the Myanmar? Probably not. And so there's an expertise required to kind of wade into this conversation professionally. Everybody's entitled to an opinion, but then you have to say, gosh, I, I didn't realize that, you know, a bunch of people were killed yesterday in this fight. I don't even know what side we're on in the Myanmar conflict. Is it even, should it even be Myanmar? Should it be Burma? Whatever. All of these questions start to bring in um, how much of this is informed by the people who inform us about things. And they certainly aren't talking about Myanmar. We want no part of that fight. It's obvious because it never makes the news. Yeah, it, it's true. I, uh, I'm the same way. I don't use that example. I use another one. Um, when, when people want to talk about, you know, war and we ask up where I, I ask who's Abu Sayyaf. <laughs> right. And they just look at me and they go, who? <laughs> pretty bad dude. Yeah. He's a bad group out there in Pacific. You, you, if you don't like war and you don't like terrorism, you probably should not like him. Right. Right. Yeah. Unless 
you have been in, <laughs> inculcated and indoctrinated into an op information operation. So when exactly. we when we see this fight in Hamas versus the IDF, how much of this, this there's two parts to this question. How much of this is information operation and how much of this is political machinations? I, I, I don't think you can separate them, right? I, so so I, I think it's a great question, but I don't think you can. The information operations aren't necessarily intended to, to just affect a societal decision. It's trying to affect a society that's going to put pressure on those politicians, right? Politicians, if, if without the pressures of society, they're, they're probably not going to do a lot, right? Yeah. So, so I think the way that you ask that question, I think it's really hard to answer because if you can convince the American people that Israel should is is bad and what they're doing is wrong, and that we we the United States who give millions and billions in defense support to Israel, that we have that we you know we have that lever right we have that lever, um, then then the decision makers in Washington and Biden who's listening to all these all these protests who by the way is coming up on an election. And they're they're important. I mean, it, it, I mean, it, it's de it's democracy. It, it's as ugly as you want it to, to to be, but it's 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 how we function. Yeah, yeah, it is it is how we function. Uh, and I guess going back to the political and the uh, information operation and and trying to one of the things I learned from all my time in combat was affect with an A beats effect, right? And so if your I O campaign is affective. If you get a response to stimuli emotionally mm -hmm. in the direction you want to go, you are going to overcome any amount of rockets because you now have the advantage, the initiative on how messaging works in this conflict. So we might go blow up and absolutely kill three horrible terrorists, but we never go there. We don't ever own that message. And so the affect that comes out is, is oh, the U.S. killed another wedding. And everybody's going to believe that. It, yeah. It's not the effect that counts. Um, it really is the affect. Now, look, effect does matter, but uh, affect is so much more. And we see that all over the place. Uh, you and I, you know, we've both been in Austria in the past year. I've walked downtown and uh, in Vienna and I've seen the, the protests. And I'm, I'm like, man, you know, there's there's a lot of affected people out there. You couldn't be more right. And, and I'll tell you, it's it's mind boggling to me. Right. Um, I think that the administ the current administration wants to support Israel, right? And that yeah. they are being affected. <laughs> you pick A or E. They're they're being right. They're being pressured by U.S. society right now. And here's what's baffling: Where is the member of the NSC going to to Bibi Netanyahu and saying, "Dude, I need you to declassify three pieces of information." I need for for three strikes that you conducted on a hospital, a mosque, or a, a school. I want you to back that whole thing up and declassify that whole thing. And I want to be able to use those and go out and say, okay, there's a lot of people who are upset that this bombing happened. But if you back up and you look at the validated intel, not just their intelligence, we're going to let our intelligence look at it and see if they come to the same conclusion, right? And then go. That they were storing weapons or they were shooting from here or they were doing right. something right that that you can disarm. And look, these are just three examples. We're not going to ask it. You know, and you could say as the president, I'm not going to ask Israel to declassify every every piece of information for every bombing campaign that they launch. But right. but, but there's a reason that they're doing this and you you don't have the full story. And, and please, again, realize War is a dragon. I, I, dude, I like that. I'm, I'm going to keep using yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And you think you put a collar on that dragon. But yeah. Um, yeah. ask that guy who's sitting in a bar contemplating the end 10 years after he's been home and ask yeah. him if that collar is on that dragon because it's not. You know, 22 a day, right? A 22 thing. a day. Yeah, so. absolutely. That's here, right? I don't yeah. even know what it is in Europe, but it's got to be a lot. You, you break people and uh, think about, man. This is this is tough, but if you really think about all of the women, and so when all the men die, the women are are exposed to horrors, and that doesn't stop. And so we we are really dismissive of how many people are dying, but also we basically have no idea of what that atrocity looks like as it plays out over the next twenty five years in people's lives. It's it's horrible.
It, you know, yeah. th and this is the thing. We're like when we when we don't when we run out of words and we go to violence. You know, it needs to be. I, I, here's what here's the thing I've been saying. Then I'm going to shut up and let you talk. If we wanted to end the violence, we would say to Hamas, "Unconditional surrender, give up the the hostages, and then things will stop." But they aren't prepared to do that. They don't want to bend their neck. They're they're launching rockets. They're fighting back every day. And so that's when the I.O. part is kind of revealed a little bit, right? And and we find out that oh, this isn't this isn't just a terrorist group that is doing this. These are people working in conjunction with that to create an effect and an effect that they want to have happen. Yeah, by the way, this is a discussion. So if I was just talking by myself, it'd get really bad. So I, I, you're welcome to jump in anytime. So that's first. Right? So, yeah. Um, I, I look at what's going on in Gaza and, 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 you know, you, you bring up, you know, a salient point. Gaza has been at war with Hamas has been at war with Israel for so long. Yeah. Right. And they've done so many things that are atrocities. Again, but look, it's war. It's just, it is, look, I, I, that's not to dismiss. So for those whatabouters out there, yes, I'm not, I'm not really pleased with some of the things that Israel's pulled up either, right? But the, yeah. the point is this, neither side, because of this, these decades of conflict, can see a place where if they were to say, okay, I do unconditionally surrender, that they don't think that it, it, there's, there's, there's light at the other at the end of the tunnel. I mean, this is the brilliance. And I look, I, I every day I grow more fond of C. Martin right? because, you know, when when Germany surrendered and Japan surrendered, the United States and the allies had the chance to say, dude, it's on. You don't have a country anymore. Right? You're gone. Right. And instead of that, they actually said, you know what? We're going to pick you up, dust you off. We give you some money. We're going to let you rebuild, uh, and we're going to make you back into a powerhouse. We just you're, you're going to have to have defensive forces only. And oh, by the way, decades later, we said, okay, you can have offensive forces now too, right? I mean, wh what what other nation in history, right, has has ever no. done this, right? No, to the, no. to the oils, and we we just gave them away. And yeah. and uh, see, Marshall, because of those decisions, created a situation where Europe and Japan, right have experienced one of the longest periods of peace in modern history. This is, but but who, who's the George C. Marshall of today that could be communicating to Hamas to say, no. look, you come in with, with that unconditional surrender thing. We are going to promise you there will be a Gaza, that there will be still Palestinians living on the water in the Mediterranean. There, you know, we, we will fight and advocate for this kind of stuff. I don't see a George C. Marshall right now. Yeah, no, I, neither do I. Um, I've got some guys coming up on the show too who work at that level, and, uh, and we'll talk. And I'll ask, and they'll say, "Not around." That's not the yeah. not political statement, but those people don't exist right now, or they don't have a voice where they can have that kind of authority to to command that thing. And uh, the guy who says Russia uh, comment, you can fuck off. I'll let Jeff talk all he wants. When you earn the stripes to get on this show, you're welcome to come on, but you're not. So shut your yap, or I'll bunch you out of here. So. <clears throat> All right. The um, the whole Israel um, Hamas thing, you know, talking about what you like when you read uh, Bibi Netanyahu's book, the one from 2022, he mm -hmm. characterizes all of these small things as wars. Right. And, and they get to describe that they have an Iron Dome defense system for a reason, because they have this antagonistic um, neighbor. And so uh, the. Um, the ability to deal with that requires them to, to machine up and everything else. And, and by the way, if you look at the history of Israel, you know, in the, in the 1900s coming forward, basically every year someone has attacked them and they are forced to be bristly. They get to believe that people want to kill them because guess what they keep trying to do? <laughs> they keep trying to kill them. And so this history that they have is, is problematic. And I, I wonder often out loud uh, on the show here is, Will we see a um, will we see a point where Palestine doesn't exist at all? I'm not talking about being recognized, but like there will be Gazans, like Rhodesians, that will walk the earth with no country. They like they Kurds. won't have a place to go. And like that's Kurds. right, like Kurds, or, or like the Chaldeans, or like the Yazidi, <laughs> yes. or all of these other people that don't um, have a place to call their own, and uh, that happens. All right, I'm going to bounce this guy, Russia guy out. But you keep talking for me for a minute while I do a little bit of a... 
a little bit of reaping. So I love my troll. By the way, I love my trolls. They're they're uh, if they're attacking me and they're not, if they're attacking the messenger and not the message, I'm 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 okay. That that means that they don't. <laughs> have it's all right. Yeah. Um. But you know, it's interesting. I think that. I think if we get to the point of, of, of where there is a ceasefire and there is a unconditional surrender, I do believe that the, one of the things that the United States will stipulate is to say if, if Israel wants to keep getting their defense budgets, right, <laughs> their, their free money, um, there, there's going to be a Palestine. There, there's going to be some, some construct of a Palestine, right? Now, it mm-hmm. might be armed and it might have NATO forces or UN forces walking around it and it might, you know, and, it, and UN's probably not the <laughs> After what we found out about the UN mission that was going on there before, I'm not so sure it's going to be the UN again. Um, but you know, it, there'll, there'll be some entity that comes in and and, and manages that. Uh, I, I, I would have a hard time believing that it won't be there. And and that should, to be fair, that's that's another strategic message that should be going coming out of you know 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue right now. Is this, hey, dude, we're 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 behind Israel, but but they were not we're not letting them eliminate. Palestine will exist at the end of this. There will be some construct of Palestine that that would at least kind of simmer some of this, you know, some of this protest. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if Pete was president, which he's not going to be, wouldn't take the job if offered. Um, I'd be talking very directly at Iran, and we would work on some kind of path. First off, let's get you to behave because otherwise it's going to start costing you things. And then once we get past that, then we can work on building you up to be less of a rogue state. But I wouldn't I wouldn't be having if, if That's where my attention would be focused. And it probably is, right? We don't get to know all these things. They happen to, uh, over at your next door neighbor's place in Switzerland. That's where all those things happen. But, um, you know, that's, that's a problem. You know, Saudi Arabia is moving towards uh, a normal Western kind of existence. They have their problems. Israel does. The U.S. does, right? But, but they're moving towards this way. Iran seems to be moving further and further away. And uh, this will transition us over back to Russia because it turns out those guys just not that far away from each other. Yeah. I, I, who, who would have thought that Saudi Arabia would be entering someone into the uh, – uh, a woman into the, the Miss Universe pageant? I mean, I, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. Big step right there. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, and we have to give yeah. credit for this. They yeah, can yeah, drive I, now. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. yeah, I don't think she's going to win. I mean, she's probably a very nice lady, but I, but hey, yeah. it's a step, right? And and I'm and I'm impressed. And to be yeah. fair, she's dressed you know, the dress that she was wearing. She's dressed very modest. Uh, she's clearly an attractive lady, and and this is obviously approved by the king, right? The, 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 right. You don't. This probably doesn't happen if the king doesn't say okay. Yeah, right. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and they are moving this direction. So how do we, if we're going to be good at statecraft, how do we get uh, Iran to come back a little bit, stop funding, which is the craziest thing, Sunni militia members to do their dirty work for them via proxy and, and yeah. get um, bring Lebanon back to the wonderful place that it is supposed to be, you know, a resort-laden, um, beautiful, I mean, <laughs> we're going in the wrong direction here, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So Tehran to Moscow, I think it's like 1300 miles. I'd have to check my distance. It's just not that far. Right. And so you can have things like pipelines. You can truck things back and forth. You can put stuff on railhead and move a lot of gear. And why wouldn't those guys support one another? Right. You know, they're sort of in this fight. And when we lose track of the fact of how influential Putin is and how he can, I'm not saying he started the October 7th attack, but he has that lever to go, why don't we pull that trigger now? I'll and you know, because the pressure was heavy on him before that. It, it was you know, it's it's interesting. I I went I went I'm publicly educated in the in the state of Indiana. So let, 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 let's start there, right? Now I've mm-hmm. graduated from NDU and stuff like that, but I'm a, I'm a, I like to try and break things down to keep them relatively simple, right? And, and I look at the United States and I, I try and look at it like a neighborhood. Right. We live in a really nice neighborhood. We got nice neighbors. Um, we got nice, so, such nice neighbors to the south. They're trying to get in. Right? <laughs> but, yeah. but I mean, relatively nor- in the north, we've got Canada. It's the longest undefended border in the world. You, you and, and to be fair, we, and we're not belligerent to our neighbors. Right? We, we don't pick on Canada. We don't we beat them up in hockey and that probably makes them mad. And I get it. Right. But yeah. Um, but you look at what goes on over in, in Far East Europe. Right. Azerbaijan, Armenia, Russia, the stands. 
this is a bad neighborhood, right? Everyone, right. this is the neighborhood that everyone has walls. They all peek over their walls, right? They try and move their walls into each other's neighborhood and in, into each other's lawn. They this try and cut true. pieces. Yes. You know, when they put up a wall, they angle it off into the into a mm -hmm. corner and like, you know, so when they they all that it's just a really bad neighbor. And that's how they've gotten along for centuries. Ever. So yeah. So that this this notion that somehow they're going to turn into a good I mean this is why I keep saying like you could talk to me about all you want about bricks right you can you can talk till you're blue in the face about bricks I okay let's see it right it's going to yeah. be a hot chocolate mess yeah yeah uh, boy all right what direction do I want to go from there okay let's <laughs> back out let's back out and let's talk about um, Elon Musk John Spencer Bill Ackerman and all these people that were interacting on X and Mm -hmm. So if you have someone like John Spencer, who we opened up talking about you know, his credentials and how fantastic he is, also a friend of mine, got his phone number in my phone right here sitting here. So uh, when Elon chimes in and says Ukraine should dig in because we don't want uh, you know Ukraine to lose um, the, its entire nation, right? I don't even know if that's a realistic uh, point of view. And then why are we going World War I digging in and holding ground? That's grisly. And at some point, Ukraine runs out of dudes in that scenario because stalemates are, well, look look at the, any of the Battle of the Somme and, and let me know how gentle that kind of war is, right? And we're talking entrenched people can't move and they have to do something to move or they get attacked. So yeah. what are your thoughts on Elon's position in general? So I, I'm going to start on my foundation of, of Elon, right? So uh -huh. I bought... Tesla stock, a lot of it in 2014 through 2016. Just loaded up on it. I believed in the guy, right? Yeah, uh, I believe he was brilliant, right? I also love, and as soon as the model, you know, the model three was taking orders, uh, I, I logged in, I threw my thousand, and I'm, I, I'm getting a model three, right? Uh, and I got one, right? And I, I've had my model three since 2018. I love the car. Uh, I am a huge proponent of Tesla. I love SpaceX. I think Elon Musk is on par with people like Howard Hughes and Einstein. I think he's literally revolutionary, right? Both of those guys are a little freaky too. Let's let it, and and Nikola Tesla, right? Also a little freaky, right? Yeah. So to expect this guy to be the kind of guy that you want your daughter to date is 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 probably a little a, a little off kilter, right? He yeah. he's not normal. But I love it, right? And world needs people like this. Don't don't get me wrong. So I'm a big Elon fan. Um, and and look, I, I there's things that he says I don't like. There are things that he does that I don't like. I I, I as the CEO of Tesla, I wish he shut his mouth sometimes because he's hurting my stock, right? Yeah, I, 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 I <laughs> yeah. like sixfold. So he, I've lost twofold. I'm still fourfold. It's that's good, right? So that's the foundation, like. Right? So I'm not. This is not a. I I, I want to beat up on Elon Musk. Right. Same. Right. So so here here's where the the, the rubber kind of meets the road on this. Right. I would never go into Elon and say, hey, your production line constructs for the Model Y or the Model 3 are jacked up. And here's why. Because I went to National Defense University and I studied logistics and I'm going to tell you because he would look yeah. at me like, you know, get the hell out of here. I would look at I look at it the same way when he comes to me and tells me that this is what can happen. Um, look, there's a picture of Adolf Hitler standing in front of uh, standing in Paris in front of the Eiffel Tower, right? And and there were people at that time saying, "Hey." France, you, you still got a monicum of a piece of land down there in the south. Move the move the capital down to someplace on the coast. Keep what you got. Settle. Just get out because you're you're going to lose all your all your men. You're going to lose your resources. You're going to lose everything. Right? There were people who wanted to negotiate with Hitler. Right? And now we know how history turned out. I mean, his, he got pushed back. Right? The United States joined the war. Other people came in and said, "Hey, you can't be a bully and a thug." Do I think that the that, so, so let's be careful? Do I think that the United States is going to start giving P, you know, sending troops? And no, that that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there's still a lot of fight left in Ukraine. They're not ready to give up. 
to just assume defensive positions is a really bad strategy because it, it like if you've ever played chess just to play defense you never win right <laughs> you you have to take the initiative at some point to go after the king uh that's how the games won right um so i i think it's really bad that he gives that I, he's he's not talking about these f16s coming in he's not talking about uh you know you've got macron and the polish president and now some of the there's hints that the, you know, some some of the leaders in the Baltics are actually willing to find creative ways to to maybe let their troops take a really long vacation and go do stuff, right? So this this war is not done, right? It's it's not over. Um, so I, 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 Elon, stick to building cars. I like you a lot. Um, I would love to talk to him. I'd love to go onto a space with him and and David Sachs. Uh, David Sachs is a little bit more of a nefarious actor because he he does business with Russia, right? He gets he gets his medals and stuff from Russia. So when when he comes on and he's fighting, he's he's really fighting for himself, right? He, he would love the war to end. He would love the sanctions to be lifted so that he could get back to making making money. So yeah, yeah, we are, we can get back into David Sachs uh, in a minute. Uh, the one of the amazing things, and again, to Elon's credit, he buys. Twitter. Now it's called X so that we can have these conversations. This thing is broadcasting live on X right now. Hey, everybody. And so we, he's open to this, right? And when people say, ah, he's, you know, he's always a pro free speech until this happens. And then you go and you check the conversation like, no, no, the thing that you said about him is, is still active. It's still present, you know, and if I use a word on X that the robot automatically flags, I can go in and say, I use the word faggot properly. I was talking about a bundle of sticks. And they're like, oh, you know what? Never mind. And the board, you know, it comes back up. So to his credit, he doesn't mind uh, allowing, you know, within within reason that I think that we all are willing to say, you can say whatever you want, but you can't do certain things that involve violence and that kind of thing. So he's not doing that. <clears throat> and he promotes the conversation to happen. Um, he does not know. He does have that context for SpaceX and the Starlink system and, and what that means in terms of how he wants his commercial product to be used in war. And that that gives him a very high level, probably above strategic uh, impact on these things. But yeah, when you get into order of battle and where people need to be, that's operational and tactical. And he's, he's out of his, his depth. He's entitled to his opinion. But I think if, if we did, if we did have a, spa, a, a space or Pete would like you to do it on his show, but whatever. Um, we, I would love to sit down with him and, and talk about these things. I'm sure he's well thought in his approach, but like anybody who works that level, and this is why I do the Ground Truth Center, he doesn't have the clarity of what it means to put hot food in the mouth of someone in a trench forward. I mean, all of that stuff gets really hard and he might be great at logistics, but some of the, the reason why we're so effective and, and capable in combat is we can move anything. Our soldiers never run out of Doritos. They never run out of chew. And when they do, oh boy, you know, <laughs> it becomes a problem. So there's there's a lot of uh, things to be said about the nature with uh, the level of which he's talking about. You know, talk about the big things, talk about moving things, railheading and all that stuff. But when you get down to John Spencer's level, you get down to Jeff Fisher's level, down to P.A. Turner's level, we're going to run laps around anybody who wants to kind of half-ass that because you haven't had your boots on the ground. If you haven't been shot at, then you are already behind, significantly behind what it means to walk out into a valley in Afghanistan or walk across a farm in Ukraine knowing that you are on the playing field. When I say playing field, we all know what that means, the battlefield. So uh, have an opinion. But let's get an informed opinion and let's improve that. We can talk about David Sachs next, but any comments on that whole little thing I just said? No, you, uh, I, I I can't disagree. I mean, it, it it's a hundred percent that. I yeah. honestly believe that when Elon Musk is fully informed on situations, he makes really really good decisions. There's very rare time that he doesn't, and I just think, like you, I don't think he has the ground truth, right? I don't I don't think right. he's got all the information to make those decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that's fine. Right. That, that's, that's why the Ground Truth Center exists. We're trying to shrink that gap so the person up there can say, I need to learn more. Who is the expert on combat spying? Oh, let's get Pete. He can come in and inform us on what this really looks like. Right. And that sure. there is that missing piece. And the reason why I specifically can be so critical of someone like David Sachs or Bill Ackerman or anybody who's never really been shot at. I'm Look, I've been in a head on collision with the goddamn M1 Abrams tank. And here I am. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I know a little bit about getting shot at. So, uh, uh, yeah, let's let's get more informed. Let's continue to have these conversations. And all, more importantly, let's get in front of the decision makers who actually go and try to figure out how to do things before you go talk to Elon about Starlink. Let's let's get these folks involved because winning and provisioning and tactically succeeding are all different things and they're very difficult to do. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so we can go to David Sachs. Look, I, um, again, I, I don't know the guy, so it, it's not a it's not a personal attack. And I, I think that you know when you X is interesting, right? Because there, there's and I you know I can see you clearing out the fields every now and then, right? So it, it, if they're attacking you personally, that they they have nothing, right? They they truly can't attack your message. They can't attack. They they don't have a foundation. This goes back. I mean, it, all of this ties together, right? And and, and I. And I, if you want to attack my facts, if you think that I'm wrong, if you think that you have a better solution, please let's have a debate. You know, but right. to but to to call me out, call me names. Um, it, 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 great. To be fair, I'm I'm monetized on on X, so I'm I couldn't be happier. Right? You just keep it up, right? <laughs> I mean, and, and to be fair, I had I had my first post go over a million impressions this past month. And, oh, that's uh, great! Congratulations. Yeah, and I I my my wife was very happy. Right. That she's like, yeah. if they if you get this much money from people calling you an idiot, this is awesome. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. she's like, they're not Please calling call me an idiot. idiot. They want to know. call you an idiat. That's great. If they, if they yeah. want to tell you you're wrong 100 percent of the time and they're going to and someone's going to give you money for that. I'll, I'll join in. Right. So yeah. right. so it's 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 somewhat comical to me. Right. I, I do want to have a debate. I I you know, I don't know if you're familiar, but about a year ago. Right. I got into an arms control debate. Right uh, with Scott Ritter, do you know? Are, are you familiar with that? Yeah. Right. So, so we both agreed to write a uh, a um, one thousand word essay on who was responsible for the for the um, for all the um, arms control uh, the, the the breaking up of all the arms control agreement. He was going to say it was the U.S. responsibility. I said it was Russia. And then after we wrote it, we each had a 500 word rebuttal essay that we could write. And then we're going to post them. Right. And I'm like, this is great. To be fair, I'm not a big Scott Ritter fan. I don't I don't like pedophiles. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm that's to me, that's a little too close to home. I, I, I've got you know, I had a someone that was was in my life as a friend and he's in jail and he should be in jail. And then and that's hidden and it's gross. Right. But if you're if you're the expert that the other guys want to put forward as the as the as the guy I'm going to take on, then let's go. And and I beat him right, and and it was clear that I beat him on, on the on the arms control thing, and uh, and yeah, I'm I'm willing to have those debates. So and that's why I go into spaces. That's why I do shows like this. I really wish that, that these people that want to come up and and you know want to let, let's talk. Like, you, instead of calling me a name, tell me where I'm wrong. Tell me why I'm right. wrong. Tell me, and then lay out your case, and and let's have a discussion. And and they don't do that, right? They, they it's just easier to say I'm an idiot. Yeah, <laughs> you're an idiot. Yeah, and that's kind of what you know. As soon as they start with the insults, uh, like Russia put in a very clever insult by saying you're nobodies, but it turns out we are somebodies. And you know, I'll speak for me. Uh, I'll take the challenge. And anybody who wants to talk about ground truth and tactical things, I've yeah, I have been shot at. I have gone out and operated in a place that's very dangerous and a very dangerous job. And mostly this thing here was was what I used to keep myself safe and effective. And I was damn good at it. So yeah. um, you have to be somebody to be an expert. You know, there's this there's, there's a disconnect there where we think that if you are somebody like Elon Musk, in terms of tactical competence, he's a nobody, right? He's wonderfully successful, fantastically like smart and everything. But that's um that's a whole different thing than having expertise and in, in tactical competence or operational competence. He hasn't been to the schools to have much of an opinion there. He's welcome to have an opinion, but it, it won't be an educated one. And so when you when you take these uh, insults and everything, you kind of put them together like, oh, you're adorable. I'm harder on me than than Russia could ever be. You know, so he can say whatever he wants to say about all that stuff, because you know. I know what it is. And I'm not, again, I'm not speaking for you. And I know you've commanded troops in combat. So I already know what that you have the credentials, but I'm just not going to speak for you. So when people do throw these insults around, uh, they need to understand that, like, whatever, like, we're going to have these conversations. So I want to say that. And then the next thing I, I want to bring in is you and I can have a conversation about Ukraine and Russia. We can disagree on, let's say, 20 points in a row, right, where we're like, at, you know, animated in our disagreement. 
But I think we both can say, you know what, that there are problems though on either side of these arguments because these things are not binary. They're they're multivariate. And by the way, wrong guy gets shot at the wrong time and the whole thing falls apart. And you're like, you know what, I didn't see that coming. I didn't see that coming. And so you and I both know that we don't know enough to know anything. And anybody who claims they know everything, they haven't been shot at. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Or they're, I mean, they're not sitting in the NSC. Right. Right. So they're not sitting in the National Security Council. They're not they're not walking in, sitting in meetings with Zelensky or with Putin. Right. So and neither are we. But we've been in enough of those meetings. Where we've been around enough of those meeting situations. Right. And um, I, I, I get it. Right. Um, it, it's interesting. I, I was literally sitting as the Ukraine war started off. Right. Um, uh, with the, the invasion into Crimea. I was on calls with General Breedlove to the National Security Council, sitting with my ambassador at the OSCE and, and listening. And I, I was, instead of just listening to the topics, which of course I did, but I was able to understand and learn how the NSC works, right? Who's allowed to speak? What, how, how are decisions shaped? You know, like there's like this little, there's this little candlelight that grows over here and then people just verbally start giving it, giving it energy and, and gasoline and it, it grows into this idea, right? And and right. and it's it's very interesting to see how all that happens. Um, so yeah, I, I get it, right? And I understand how those things happen. And if people want to know, I'm I'm happy to talk about the, the them. I, I mean, it's uh, I can't talk about the classified aspects, but I could talk about the context of of sure. what was going on, and 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 that's really really important. Um, you know, I I, I don't. Uh, I don't claim to know everything, but I do know what two squadrons of F-16s are capable of, right? I flew, uh, you know, I I also like, I, I kind of chuckle, um, you know, there's no doubt that Russia outnumbers on the ground Ukrainian forces, yeah. right? Yeah. But I would argue that the Serbian forces vastly outnumbered the coalition forces during Operation Al, because we didn't even have one. We didn't even put a guy on, on the ground <laughs> during Operation Allied Force, <laughs> not one, right? We beat we beat them solely with air power, which uh, is is pretty is pretty important, right? It's pretty fun. Yeah, yeah. The thing about the candlelight, a lot of what we do is a sales job, and again, the politics come in. So your approach or your policy mindset will will create a certain amount of energy for your thing, and all of a sudden you got two candles lit because hey, you're on my team, you know, and, but. But they really, it's impossible to know. All they can really do is kind of pick a direction and then put decisions that no one can make on the boss's table, whoever, whatever level of boss we're talking about. It's the same thing in the Intel world. If I go out and I tell you what I think, you, know, you can you can question my analysis, but you can't question what I observed and, and where I was. Yeah. Those are just the facts, right? And so we're all trying to put these things together. And, and I'll just talk from the Intel point of view. If I go out and I find out a crucial piece of information and it's a, it takes me a paragraph to explain one little part of it. Now, I'm writing in a vertical and a horizontal manner, so it's very hard to write these sentences so they stay clear. An analyst will go and pull out the piece they need, which might completely change all of the context and put it into their yeah. report and say, you know, whatever it is. And, and they don't do this to be mischievous or, or to be deceiving. It's just given what they see, they take something out of context for me. And all of a sudden I see my words and I'm like, that is 180 degrees, not what I am talking about. So I'll get a hold of that analyst and I'll say, hey, uh, who wrote this report? you got to know that is not what I saw. And they're welcome to pull my thing out. I'm not challenging anybody, but I am trying to provide that ground truth so they can make a better decision. The NSC is the earth to the moon away from me. And so my ability to inform them, it just doesn't exist. There's well, no way for the telephone game to work. Yeah, fair. But I, I, I don't sell yourself short. I think I look, I, I know a lot of Intel analysts and they're they're all they're all great guys. Right. I, yeah, I, there's not yeah. one I can think of that I didn't I didn't enjoy having a discussion with. And and look, almost every single one of them to a T also, you know, would would pull the PDB, the president's daily brief every day and see if any of their analysis got in the P because that's a big deal. Right. It's a yeah. huge deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh and I've never seen a one get more mad when something that he, one of his pieces, got put in, completely out of context. Right. right. So, yeah. so the PD, so the people putting together the PDB, a presidential's daily brief, right, for Intel, uh, had taken something that he had said and twisted it to the point where they wanted to, and now it's going to the president, right, and everyone right. else who right. reads the PDB, uh, and yeah, so it's yeah, so I, I get it, man. I, I completely understand. 
I want to go back to John Spencer a little bit because his academic work is important because it, it and it takes a long time. These are just whatever's worse than ponderous. These are very slow moving machines, like a hundred year clock. And so he's saying, pay attention, urban warfare, these types of conflicts, all this tunnel warfare going on, we may never encounter that again, or it may become the norm. You don't know. And so the people that do the planning at the higher levels are trying to sort out how do we build that capacity? Because right now I got a bunch of Marines that know how to donkey stomp a door, go in and take out bad guys in a room. And you're telling me now we got to develop um, tunnel fighting capability. And oh my gosh, all the decisions that go into that, you know, we can't, we can't build a new ship. It takes decades for us to build a ship, right? And so you're talking about tactics that are going to get be brought in because of John Spencer's work and have no doubt like everybody that people are paying attention to what John says. So we have to build that capacity. And if you've chosen the wrong lane, <laughs> there's no recovering from that because the guys on the ground have to adapt to the actual fight that's there. And so there is none of these jobs are easy. And it's very easy to say, wow, Pete's a compelling guy. His storytelling is great. We're going to take his thing. And, you know, of course, I believe in what I do. Right. But if I'm wrong, if, if it's if it's seven slots over where the right decision is, you never get to know that. You just go to the ground and you go do what you have to do. And so when Elon says dig a trench or when David Sachs says, oh, it's easy. You know, this is how you have to do it to make the war stop. They could be right, <laughs> but they could also probably more likely than not. They're wrong, just like me. Yeah, I, I can't I can't go into too much of this, right? But the, the whole concept of urban warfare and subterranean warfare, right? That 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 was the one that was getting really concerning. Um, so out here, there's a training range called Grafenvir, right? That's it's the big army training range. But what's interesting is Austria is kind of the the home to, if you will, of 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 these of digging these tunnels, right? So these tunnels through the mountains and through the Alps. There's a lot of Austrian companies that 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 are exceptional at this. And uh, and I know that there were talks between the company that built uh, for a university um, a tunnel system that was a the whole subway system. It's it's one station basically, and then a, a, but the whole subway station is a training ground for emergencies, for first mm -hmm. responders, right? So there's observers, there's observer stations, there's cameras, there's everything. This this whole setup is for first responders to be able to go in and, because you can't shut down the Vienna subway system <laughs> to do to do first oh. responders. So they created, <laughs> they created the, this thing and some special people went in and said, that is awesome. We would really like to build something like that where we could also do first responder <laughs> training, but responding to a different type of situation. So I'll end there. This, this is crazy. At least they're smart. The, uh, I love that you brought up Grafenvir, Hohenfels. These are massive training grounds. And, and the world's your oyster if you're a commander on what you want to train on, whether it's mass cal events or, you know, um, whatever, order of battle. Mm -hmm. If I go there in my job, I'm in Vilsack and we're doing uh, practice source meets and I'm drinking hot chocolate all day because I'm the mayor of Vilsack and people come in and they meet with me, right? Like that's how different the world is. But if I don't do that, if you don't have someone who's got my experience, I need to play the roles, right? That's what that people should pay me to play roles all the time and teach spies how to do spy stuff. Uh, if you don't have that hard experience, if I'm not making them chase me as a source, then uh, I don't care how much time you spend on Graf and Veer as, as a speed to get the fuck off of there. You need to get into those second have source meet after source meet. That is not how we train, though. We go out and we're like, you know, every soldier must carry a rifle. Like, get out of here with your adorable rifle self. You don't need your counterintelligence agents carrying rifles. You need them to be proficient at conversations. Sure, have a mastery over the weapon, be able to take it apart, but get them to Vilsack, hire great role players who have been shot at, who've run sources in combat, and get them smart on that so that they can do the, the four things that I'm supposed to do as a combat collector. Help the commander win more, lose less, help the enemy lose more, and win less. And if I can create that capacity, then you have a chance at, at putting my eyes, my experience, my my networking, so that when I go to talk to Colonel Fisher, he's like, oh, this motherfucker knows what he's doing. And I can help you run your machine because you don't have enough guys like me and we don't build enough guys like me, right? And that's just my little tiny discipline. Yeah, That goes to every single discipline. Like how much time do we waste 
my, my, one of my mm. biggest pet peeves in the military is when they teach you in the native um, language that you're going to go to. We're going to go to uh, some part of Afghanistan where they speak Dari, and they teach you how to say the words, do you speak English in Dari? And I'm like, all you have to do is say, do you speak English? If they do, they will say yes. And if not, they will look at you like you're crazy and say, no. Yeah. And why did we just spend five minutes learning that phrase, right? We should yeah. do something else. We're so bad at prioritizing tactical cap capability because of these things like computer training or time on a range or whatever it's going to be. So, Pete, you're, you're going to love this, right? Sort of a quick vignette for you, right? So, <laughs> yeah, and, and this is one of my this is one of my favorite vignettes because you just hit on something. When we talk about Graf and Beer and Hohenfels and the training range, right? So, 20... Early 2014, uh, Crimea gets invaded by little green men. The, I'm at the OSCE as the senior military advisor, the chairman's advisor, and my ambassador. And my ambassador at the time, Ambassador Bear, right? Ambassador Dan Bear, uh, builds a relationship. I, I set it up with Major General Cavoli, who is the commander of the training ranges, right? And he says, hey, uh, he sells General Cavoli. He's like, look, I'm the ambassador here, and we, we have 57 nations. Uh, many of these people don't, uh, th these are ambassadors on security from European nations who don't understand truly how coalition forces work and, and what, what they do. And I'm looking at my ambassador, I'm like, there's no way that these ambassadors don't, I, I, sir, I just can't believe you, right? But he's like, no, fish, I'm telling you, when I have the conversations, <laughs> these guys are clueless. And I said, okay. So Kovoli invites them to come up. So we bring a busload of OSCE ambassadors to Hohenfelds, right? Spend the night, nice dinner, do the ambassador stuff. But then General Kovoli brings everyone out onto the battle space in the training range, okay? And in the middle of the training range, you know this, there's a coffee shop in a little village, right? And they go in and they buy coffee. And of course... There, there are all these ambassadors are kind of looking around like, why is there, why is there a coffee shop in the middle, in the middle of a combat range? And um, a, the German ambassador, the funniest thing, because Hohenfeldt and Grafenier are in Germany. Like, he's a right. German. This is in Germany. He goes, General, why is there a coffee shop in the middle? He's like, like when we when we take a country, like, or we take a, a, a village, we have to manage it. We have to establish a mayor. We have to make sure that the people, because if they turn on us, now we're fighting multiple wars. We have to give the right. people what they need. And, yeah. and I was amazed that the, the German ambassador sitting at the OSCE giving advice and information on, you know, European security had no clue that his forces, he just thought it was a bunch of tanks that ran into each other. Yeah, and, right, right, right. And, and that's, that is a great assumption, right? And this goes yeah. to the overall <laughs> point about ground truth. Yeah, exactly. But, but you would have loved, yeah. I, I, I sat there and I was befuddled when I watched him ask that question. Yeah, yeah. It's um and, th and then just going back to my and we're not trying to talk about my job specifically, but but I think it illustrates the point. Like it's so specific and and it's so diversified once you get in there. And I imagine I imagine flying things and provisioning the flying of things is, is the same thing where like I'm a pilot. However, this is the one little silo where I have my expertise. If you ask me anything about this one, which we are the same jobs, we'll understand each other, but I can't do that's how that's how my job is. So when I go into Vilsec, which is, you know, it's 20 minutes away, right? I have to get cleaned up. I can't have all this army paint on me because commander like, where's your war paint? You're like, hey, all right, I need to not shave. I need to look like a German dude because I have to go operate. I have to operate in Germany proper to work on how do I blend in without looking like I'm blending in. And these are very subtle things to stand out. And then, of course, you know, in my case, um, the, the battalion commander and his W5 come walking up in, in their fatigues and their, in their uniforms. And I'm trying to, I'm sitting in a cafe for hours and I'm trying to like, Hey, get the heat off me, man. <laughs> like, I don't want people to know, but all that stuff is, is what goes into being capable at the ground level. And, and so when someone like David Sachs comes in and talks about things and he's got business, you know, things, okay, great. But, but how do I feed that strategic advantage? How do I feed that? tactically and operationally so that we can move the strategic dial closer towards his, whether he's wrong or right. Yeah. If I can't give him any kind of win in that, in that string of things that has to happen, then, then the guy at the ground is left holding the bag going, Hey, I'm just trying to survive out here. I haven't had green lettuce in weeks. I get brown lettuce. Right. And, and David Sachs has no idea what that existence is like. I lived on a bookcase for a month at one point, 
real. Like that's actually happened and not taking shower, all these things that that warrior has to do. It's fine. We're tough. We'll take it. But when we lose sight of what these things mean, it's, it's, uh, it's easy to get shit wrong and, and not feed the strategy because you, you're not in any way tied to the ground. Yeah. hundred percent. Right. And, and there's, there's sacrifice, right. And, and they, so when, when we get, when we talk a, a little bit passionately about this, it, it's, it's not because we think we're going to lose or we're trying to defend a position that's undef- indefensible. It's yeah. because I had skin in the game, right? It's right. because I, I, I lost a guy, you know, I, my whole battalion, right? I lost one guy. And, and since, mm. since 2007, I've had his, his name on my wrist. Right. Um, and, you know, yeah. and, and then as a, as an O five <laughs> in, in a combat zone, um, I didn't have a bathroom in my bunk. So every night, if I had to get up, I had to go to the bathroom. I had to walk 100 meters mm-hmm. in the cold, like you know, right in the Hindu Kush, right, uh, to go to yeah. the bathroom, right. And and uh, and I, there's many nights where I walked in. I said, look, when I get home, if anyone challenges my freedom or decides that they're going to try and shut me up, I'm going to kill them because <laughs> because, <laughs> because that, look, I, I this is so horrible. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I'm doing it right. I'm doing it. I, I swore an oath to my constitution. I love my country. And, and, uh, and I think if, if I can come at it with those two things, like, look, I, I, I love the country. I, I love America. It, it's not perfect. Right. But it's the, it's, it's one of the greatest things. And if you're willing to listen to me, I'm willing to listen to you and let's have a discussion about yeah. things. I, I think that's a great starting point in many places. There's some people that you just can't start there. Like I love Russia. I like, probably shouldn't talk. Yeah. 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 I lived, I lived on what would be Hoth, you know, in, in Shajoy, in Zabul. <laughs> oh my God. It was covered in ice, you know, because it snowed and we didn't have a way to get rid of the snow. And so we just stomped on it until it became an ice rink, but it's like an ice rink, like an ocean. And so you were going to fall down every day. I went, and I was so sick. I got the flu so bad. And one of the times I fell and I threw my flashlight in the air as I fell. So it's going, whoa, whoa, whoa. so I hit the ground Ooh, and I'm like, Oh God, cause I'm sick. I feel terrible. And I'm like, and now my flashlight's going to hit me in the face. Bam. And I'm like, I get horrible. <laughs> like, but that's it's like a cartoon. It was, I was like, I'm like the Wiley Coyote right now. Like looking at the camera, here it comes. And then bam. And it hit me. And I'm just like laying there on the ground from like, all right. You know? And so, that is how hard it is to walk to and from chow at times. You know, yeah. all of our um, shower facilities are broken. And so I had, I had to take a shower. And so I'm taking the ice cold water coming out of the broken PVC pipe. And I'm doing like a hose bath, but with ice cold water from a broken PVC pipe, because that was the only way to shower. And, and then I got to go do high end work and talk to high end people. And, and so all of that stuff goes into these conversations that we're trying to have with Elon Musk and everything else, because it's easy to say, all you have to do is, but then you have to have the people do that shit and then they got to do it right. And it's got to feed the ultimate answer, which I've said over and over again, but that is hard to do. Do you ever want to see the NSC scramble, take a green beret, most practical guys ever put them in a decision brief and let them ask a question whenever they want. And they're going to, they're going to, I call them hand grenade questions. They go, ding, and they roll the, the question into the obvious thing. And so I, I got to, I got to do this one time. We were in Iraq and I'm in a visiting, I'm visiting a province that, Hey Pete, come in. You've got experience in other areas. We'd like to see what you think. So I'm sitting in this um, prep for a commander's brief. They're trying to decide are they going to build the victory tower to, to be the gift to the, uh, to the Iraqi people. And they're going through and all these things. And they were talking down to the Iraqi government. Uh, we'll just tell the mayor what to do and the governor. We'll just tell them, but the ambassador, Oh man, let's make sure we wipe down the toilets and get everything perfect for the ambassador. And so they're talking about how, like, you know, should we build this victory tower? Should we not do it? And then I just raised my hand and I always, Jeff, this is what I always do. But is this one of those meetings where we just um, ask hard questions or, or, or do we just agree with everything? You know, because it's loaded. And they're like, no, no, uh, mystery man. We want to hear what you think. And I just said, have you guys asked the governor or about what, what they need? Because you guys are leaving. You want to build a tower. I, I'm just guessing that he's got different needs. Like, if you're going to do something, you know, like electricity is super important. And so I said that, then we went to lunch and all these captains and majors and colonels came up to me. Hey, thanks for saying that. <laughs> because you think big and, and you think like these grand things and, and, and legacy, but the reality is the guy running the place who's going to be there when you leave, he doesn't have electricity in his own goddamn building if you don't get that right. And so that little village thing in, in Grafenbeer, I think it's in Grafenbeer, 
if you haven't accounted for that, what that dude needs to stay alive, he's going to get killed or he's going to leave. And and so how do you win in a place like Ukraine, which is rife with corruption next door to its enemy? And they're going to be next door when they're done and they're going to have to transact business. And we can't make it so it's so hard to transact business that they do it illegally. Right. These are hugely complicated things. Yeah. No, you're, it's true. Right. And uh, um, w- when it gets to a decision brief for a flag officer, everyone thinks that the briefing is so polished that there's not a, an ounce of anything wrong. And, and, and many times there is. And, the, and that's really sad. Yeah. 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 Well, listen, we talked for just over an hour and I don't want to keep you too long, but um, what are your thoughts in general? I mean, obviously, we'd love to sit down with Elon and have this conversation. Bill Ackerman. Uh, I mean, you know, John Spencer is great. We can do that in a second with him, even David Sparks. What um, besides that, what else do you want to say in closing? Look, I, I think real quick we should talk about that. And, and I want to get this out uh, for people who are listening. Right. We, we need to talk about the, these nuclear threats that are coming out of Moscow. OK, let's um, do it. because I think that, um, look, I, I don't like the, the idea of nuclear war than anybody else. I, I think it's it's horrible. Right. It's horrific what mankind is, is created in, in its ability to destroy itself. Um, so, so I'll put that out, but, but since the 19, you know, fifties, 1960s, nuclear game strategy and games, a horrible word for this, right. Is based on, on deterrence game theory, right. And deterrence game theory, everyone loses once the first missile is in the air, everyone loses the game's over. So, so the no, you can't apply conventional war theories, Right. You can't say mass maneuver, you know, like surprise. These tenets of warfare don't exist in nuclear war. It's completely a different it's a completely different game. Right. So I think when you you, you have to understand that Russia's bloviating and, and, and Medvedev's talking about we'll just launch a nuke. Well, he can say that. And it does scare people because because, again, people don't understand. Uh, but by the same token, if you if you think through that, there's a couple problems. The first problem is if he shoots a nuke at a at a, at a NATO country, that's Article Five, and uh, the the war expands, right? If right. he shoots it at Ukraine, okay, a couple things can happen. The first thing that can happen is if the winds carry the the fallout over Russia, he's going to kill his own people because it's not going to stay just over Ukraine, right? right? And if the winds carry it to the west, it's going to fall out over NATO. Right. Right. So in other words, he has a weapon that he can't completely contain and control. Right. And if the fallout does happen over a NATO country, it's Article 5. Right. Because he launched a nuclear weapon. He might have said, I didn't intend to kill thousands and thousands of Romanians or Poles or Germans, but his intent doesn't matter. It's Article 5. So so he he so as a guy who wants Ukraine to win, I'm like, hey, all right, dude, you've just invited everybody into the war. Right. And you're probably going to lose. The other thing that I think is important to understand is the reason that someone uses a nuclear weapon is when they when when it's an existential threat, that their existence is going to com- be completely gone. Ukraine has never said that they intend to go all the way and march to Moscow and take over the Kremlin. They just want to go back to their 2013 borders. There is literally no existential threat for Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin and the Moscow to continue to exist. Right. There's no threat of that. That's that's not what what the uh, Ukraine's after. So the notion that he would use it because he's just going to lose any of the gains he's had since 2013 is a, is it, it's not. I mean, it, as Elon Musk would say, that's illogical. Right. That's that doesn't make sense. Right. So so I think it's important. To have, it's, it's scary to talk about, but we yeah. should be talking about. It, right. And um, and I think that the again, the administration could do more to kind of ease some of these concerns that they're, they're really being tight lipped. I, I, I think back to some other presidents, whether it's Clinton, Obama, Bush, there would be a lot of more communications coming out on what's going on under former presidents. This one has been unfortunately quiet and quiet leads to, to fear. Well, I'll be critical uh, on the team playing right now. Yeah. Not political, not political, but critical. Um, these guys have made a lot of mistakes and they've graduated up the ranks over the last 25 years. And so they are prone to errors. 
And so maybe they are doing something behind the scenes, but, you know, until they prove otherwise, they reliably get things wrong often enough that I don't give them the benefit of the doubt and they haven't earned it. So there is that part of it. And the other thing I wanted to say, nuclear war, World War III, these are things we throw out there really fast because they are scary, as you said. But the amount of energy, the amount of money it takes to have a World War III, it's just not there. You know, there's there are too many other things. We're not, we're so interconnected. Our interconnectedness has made this a lot harder now. Now, could it could expand and, and bring in other players in the Middle East? And could that link to Europe? Sure, maybe. But it's really hard to keep that much animosity and struggle. Very expensive. And and so it's, it is almost – I mean, every time a trillion-dollar ship gets sunk, like how are you going to replace that, right? Like it's, just, it's really hard to do. True, Pete, but – but yeah. words have literally lost their their meaning. World War well, Three, nuclear that. war, you're yeah. a Nazi. Right. I, 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 yeah. Name them all. I mean, right? That, yeah. that none of them mean... Even existential threat. Everything's an existential threat. <laughs> right. <yet> everybody exists. <laughs> right. Exactly. Sorry, you got, you got me. Right? Um, yeah. So, um, but, but we throw them around so much, they, they, don't, they yeah. don't carry the gravitas that they probably should anymore. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. So I'm with you on the nuclear war thing. And and by the way, if you don't want to be the guy who leads Russia, yeah, do it. And there's no tactical nuke, right? That's still going to be, again, if Pete was president, which he's not, he would refuse the job if offered. Uh, there'd be a problem. There'd be one of your peers whoo, flying over and and sending some messages like, hey, uh, Putin, I'm uh, going to send some messages here. Um, here's a list of targets you can pick from them. The rockets are already on the way. So this is going to happen. What do you want us to do? Because, you know, this is going to cost. And then you're going to need to step down. All right. Thanks, Mike. You know, and then that's it, right? You just like, they would, he would get hit so hard. Russia wouldn't be the same Russia anymore. You know, the Kremlin could be in rubble. It, it would be deservedly so, right? There's just, it's so far beyond the pale. You hope that it doesn't happen because all the reprisal would just be awful. It would make October 7th look like nothing. The amount of death and destruction and all of the war dragons get out then and, and feast on Russia's corpse. Yep. I'm with you. Anything else to say before we wrap this up? I had a great time. Thanks a lot for inviting me back. I love and it. And I'm glad. You, I love watching you fight the trolls down below. It was good. You did, you did a good job. <laughs> it was an awesome job. Yeah, well, I got a bunch of angry A's fans coming after me on Twitter, too, so that's always fun. But, you know, that's a different story. All right. I'll, uh, I'm going to roll this. I'll say goodbye to you in a sec. Thanks, everybody. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours truly. Thank you so much for watching.